Hi, everyone. Um, uh, I'm Courtney. I'm the Non-Human Rights Project's Director of Government Relations and Campaigns, and I am Zooming in from West Hollywood, California, and I'm so pleased to have the amazing Dr. Lori Marino joining us um, today. And I'm going to do a brief introduction, and it definitely doesn't cover nearly, it doesn't touch on an ounce of everything that she's accomplished and that she's working on. So I'm going to do a brief introduction and then welcome Lori to give us um, a little bit about or tell us about her background and um, and then we'll we'll start with questions. So um, we're pleased to have Dr. Lori Marino joining us. She's a neuroscientist and expert in animal behavior and intelligence and formerly on the faculty of Emory University. She's the founder and president of the Whale Sanctuary Project in the Camilla Center for Animal Advocacy. Lori received her PhD in biopsychology from the State University of New York at Albany and is internationally known for her work on the evolution of the brain and intelligence in dolphins and whales. In 2001, she co-authored a groundbreaking study offering the first conclusive evidence for mirror self-recognition in bottlenose dolphins. And she's appeared in several films and television programs, including 2013 documentary Blackfish about killer whale captivity, Unlocking the Cage, and Long Gone Wild, the 2019 documentary that picks up where Blackfish left off and the work of the Whale Sanctuary Project begins. So welcome, Lori. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And where are you uh, zooming in from? Well, I am zooming in from southern Utah, Canal. Uh, and uh, that's, that's where we live these days. Oh, <laughs> so nice. Um, so I uh, uh, wanted to see if you could just briefly go over your background, and then we'll get into all of the work that you've been doing um, with the Camilla Center and the Whale Sanctuary Project. Sure, uh, and thanks everyone for tuning in, and hi everyone. Um, so I'm a neuroscientist by training, and I've uh, been studying the uh, the brains of dolphins, and whales, and primates for about 30 years now. Um, I've done all of that uh, non-invasively. Um, and what I'm interested in is essentially what it's like to be a member of another species. And I'm particularly interested in how the brain is related to cognition and behavior in other species. And so I've been doing a lot of work on that uh, for quite some time. As you mentioned, I was at Emory University for almost 20 years. And there I conducted research and also uh, taught. And I taught uh, courses such as uh, research methodology, uh, imaging, brain imaging, uh, as well as uh, courses on animal cognition uh, and other kinds of uh, neuroscience courses like that. Oh, fantastic. Um, and I don't know if anyone knows, but Lori used to be an, uh, part of the NHRP team, and she was a science director um, for the NHRP for several years um, prior to to me joining, um, and you played an integral role in our um, cases, helping gather, helping us gather and understand the science that supports chimpanzee and elephant cognition. Um, and I wanted to just ask, what made you interested in working with the NHRP, and um, sort of how how you came to uh, working with Steve? Well, uh, you know, yes, that that has been um, a highlight, and I look forward to working with you even further. Um, so a few years ago, I met Steve at a conference and got to know what the Non-Human Rights Project was doing and uh, was very, very interested. And the reason I was so interested is because here was an organization that was actually an animal rights organization look, looking to achieve le uh, legal rights for other animals. And, you know, rights is, is a, a very broad term. I like the fact that the Non-Human Rights Project is looking to, uh, to, to promote uh, legal rights um, that are enforceable, because I think that that is really the only way that we can uh, give actual protections to other animals. It doesn't, it's, it's, it's something that if you violate it, well, you know, there's 
a consequence to that. So I really like that. And the other thing is that, you know, the NHRP really bases all of its arguments on science. And as a scientist, I, I feel very strongly that, you know, evidence, empirical work, data, all of that is a very powerful tool um, to be used um, advocating for anyone, including animals. Yeah, um, I've, uh, you know, joining the NHRP, I've really learned a lot about the use of science and advocacy and how, what important and critical role it plays. Um, and that's, that's really exciting for me as well. Um, but I wanted to get your thoughts on, you know, some people are initially confused as to why we argue that chimpanzees, elephants, um, and certain marine or cetaceans um, are deserving of personhood. Um, and I was wanted to know from a scientist's perspective, why do you feel that non, the non-human animals we represent should be declared legal persons entitled to the right to liberty? Well, that's a six million dollar question. <laughs> the answer is that uh, because they have all the same characteristics that we recognize in ourselves um, as being the hallmarks of, of personhood. So we recognize autonomy, having self-awareness, we recognize um, having a life, a social life, emotions, an autobiographical sense of time, sense of one's life. Um, those are the things that we rely on to say that humans are persons under the law. And it turns out that from the scientific perspective, many other animals have those same characteristics. So it's logic. If they have those characteristics, then um, they need to be recognized as persons under the law as well, if we want to be logically consistent. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> that makes so much yeah. sense. You know, it, this is, it is really a great test of whether we are willing to base our, our cultural practices on logic and data, or we, we want to go, you know, we want to continue to be biased to it and ignore the empirical evidence. Um, if we say that we want to base our decisions upon data and empirical evidence, then it almost has to be the case that many other animals who share these characteristics have to be recognized um, in a basic way for being, for being uh, uh, persons. Yeah, definitely. And I think I, I, I wanted to ask, I don't know if you followed, uh, you, were, you again played such a critical role in Tommy and Kiko's case um, and the science that we had supporting or proving their autonomy and supporting the arguments for um, them being declared legal persons and the um, entitled to the right to liberty. Uh, it was so strong um, and it went all the way up to the New York Court of Appeals. Yeah. And although the court declined to hear our case, there was a judge, um, Judge Fahey, who um, basically said what you just said. Um, and I wanted to read a portion of his um, opinion and just get your thoughts since you work so hard on this case um, and what you think it means for the future of um, the use of science in legal advocacy as well as um, how it could play a role in achieving rights or the significance in the fight for non-human rights or rights for non-human animals. Um, and in his opinion, Judge Fahey um, stated that the issues that NHRP raised amounts to a refusal to confront a manifest injustice for the question of non-human animals' rights to legal, uh, for the question of non-human animals' right, non-human animals' legal personhood and rights constitutes a deep dilemma of ethics and policy that demands our attention. To treat a chimpanzee as if he or she had no right to liberty protected by habeas corpus is to regard the chimpanzee as entirely lacking of independent worth as a mere resource for human use, a thing, of a, a thing the value of which consists exclusively in its usefulness to others. Instead, we should consider whether a chimpanzee is an individual with inherent value who has a right to be treated with respect. Um, and then he ends with saying, while it may be arguable that a chimpanzee is not a person, there is no doubt that it is not merely a thing. Well, yeah, I mean, that was a landmark uh, statement that was made. And, you know, it's due to the fact that the NHRP was able to so 
beautifully make the argument for personhood in chimpanzees. And, you know, what, what we have to do now is really, you know, take a look at all those statements and say, is, you know, if, again, where, where does that point us? What direction does that point us in? Because uh, it seems to only point in one direction. You, there's a certain point where you can't resist the weight of the evidence anymore. And, and so, you know, we're hoping that in the future, judges will be able to not resist the weight of the evidence and go beyond um, just the, the talk and, and actually enact uh, what, what this judge said. Yeah, uh, and we've seen that with our, our case with Hoppy, um, Judge Allison to it really played cl close attention. I mean, we had 13 hours of oral arguments and she placed great weight on the scientific evidence supporting um, Hoppy's autonomy and the right for, to liberty. And while she felt bound by precedent, um, the, the weight of the scientific evidence and, and support for her autonomy, um, it, it couldn't be refuted. And it just shows the strength of scientific arguments versus purely emotional, um, most emotional based arguments. And I think that the power of science is really evident in the work that we're doing and the work that you're doing that, that uh, scientists, scholars, um, or scientists, advocates, scholar advocates <laughs> um, yeah. are doing. Um, and that sort of leads us into your work with the Camella Center for Animal Advocacy and your promotion of the use of science um, in advocacy. And for those that don't know, um, you're the president of the Camella Center for Animal Advocacy, which supports scholar -based, scholarship based advocacy. Um, and could you speak a little bit about the work you do there and what it means to be a scholar advocate? Yeah, absolutely. A uh, scholar advocate isn't a term you hear about a lot or see a lot, especially when it comes to other animals. But um, what a scholar advocate is, is somebody who is a scholar who is also an advocate for a cause. And a scholar advocate embodies something really important. That is that someone who has expertise in an area is also using their expertise to advocate for better protections, a better life, or fill in the blank. It could be children, it could be other humans. In this case, it happens to be other animals. And I started this in 2011 um, for a lot of reasons, but primarily because I was seeing a lot of pre-med and pre-neuroscience students uh, in my office at Emory telling me things like, well, I don't really want to do vivisection. And, and people are saying, well, just get used to it. Or if you really can't get used to it, then get out of neuroscience and go do something else. And, and, I, and that's patently unfair. It's cruel. And you lose a lot of talent telling bright, talented students to, you know, toe the line or get out. So that was very influential in my trying to create an, an or, creating an organization that helps students uh, to become scientist animal advocates. Um, and we, we uh, just, it, there's no inherent, you know, conflict between the two. Um, and I want students to know that they can be both a scientist and an animal advocate. And I would go further than that and say that the most powerful uh, position one can be in is as a scientist and an animal advocate. Uh, because you know the most about the animals you're advocating for. Um, so in that sense, uh, I want to promote bringing those two things, science and animal advocacy together in, in a formal way, in, in an in-depth way, uh, so that we can, uh, so we can have a generation of students who are scientists but are not afraid to advocate for other animals. And since you started, um, you know, working on integrating science Science, scientists with animal advocacy, has there been a receptiveness amongst the, um, the community to, to embrace that and to maybe go against the mold of what historically has been the case and not melding um, scientific research with animal advocacy? Well, you know, I think that there, that is this whole notion of can we, um, 
rehabilitate science? Can we do science um, in a way that makes um, uh, the use of animals uh, something of the past? And, and I, that's a big lift. And it, hopefully that will happen soon. What's really important, though, is to say this, is that no matter what your colleagues do, if they're doing vivisection or terminal research, it's really important to keep the line of communication open and to always act respectfully towards them. I was at Emory, a huge research facility, uh, university, for many years. They have uh, chimpanzee research going on there, all kinds of things. And actually, um, I always maintained um, uh, an open relationship with my colleagues, even those who were doing work that I would never do and that I want to see change because, because that line of communication is really important. And I think that had I not done that, I would have gotten a lot of, a lot of pushback. But because I didn't do that, I was welcomed more. Yeah, and I think that that's a good strategy. And I think that's what we've seen as well in our work. We make yes. no point not to vilify or criticize anyone right. that's holding animals, holding animals captive because a lot of them are well-meaning and have, um, you know, the emotionally invested in the lives of, of the animals and, you know, they don't necessarily intend to do any harm, um, but it's just the status quo and changing people's perceptions and um, making them realize that um, you don't have to continue doing the things the way they've always been. Exactly. Um, you know, as we learn more about specific or certain non-human animals and their cognitive abilities and what their needs are, um, it, it shows us that we, we do need to change and we do have to change. And um, science has played such an important <laughs> role in that. Um, as well as um, the respect that we have to maintain amongst um, everyone within the community. Well, exactly. And I just wanted to, I mean, you mentioned Happy the elephant. Happy was, uh, Happy is a very famous elephant. Why? Because she was the subject of a, a study done a few years ago in which uh, she demonstrated that she could recognize herself in a mirror. And that's a very uncommon capacity in the animal kingdom. It shows that there's something about her sense of self that overlaps with ours. Um, she was the very elephant who, who was the, you know, uh, the, su the subject of a study that showed something really remarkable and showed that she had a trait that we commonly consider to be a trait of a person. And so it's, it's ironic that even though she specifically, personally demonstrated mirror self-recognition that we're still trying to get her out of the situation. Yeah, it's, um, she's, she's definitely earned her recognition of personhood um, and demonstrated that she yes. and Patty, um, the other elephant with her deserve to be, That's right. to um, live freely um, and, that's why we continue to fight to, to have Happy sent to um, a sanctuary. Um, I guess maybe I'll jump ahead since you brought up Happy's uh, mirror self-recognition test because you were the co-author of, um, in 2001, you co-authored the first study um, which found that dolphins are self-aware um, when Presley and Tab passed the mirror self-recognition test. And Presley and Tab were two bottle, captive bottlenose dolphins at Forget the name of the aquarium. aquarium. The New York Aquarium, uh, part of the Wildlife Conservation Society, which is basically just a zoo. Um, and they were living in Coney Island. I, I didn't even know they were part of the Wildlife Conservation Society because the Wildlife Conservation Society also owns and operates the Bronx Zoo where Happy is. Exactly. exactly. So, um, Same organization. <laughs> so, <laughs> and they're still holding, I mean. Just, yeah. <laughs> um, but uh, if, do you, would you be able to speak a little bit about what, what made you want to do that study? Um, what the, I mean, we know what the findings were. Um, maybe speak a little bit about Presley and Tab and what, how their story um, impacted your um, career tra trajectory and um, uh, advocacy for animals. 
Yeah, well, when I was a graduate student, uh, my, my uh, PhD advisor was Gordon Gallup. And he was the first person to show that a non-human being could recognize themselves in mirrors. And he showed that in chimpanzees a uh, long time ago. And I wanted to determine whether or not dolphins could recognize themselves in mirrors because I knew that like chimpanzees, dolphins were, had large complex brains, they were socially complex. Um, but what was intriguing is that they weren't primates. So the question is, can a non-primate recognize themselves in mirrors? We know we do, we know that gorillas and, and all the great apes do. So uh, Diana Reese and I embarked on a, a long-term uh, study of this possibility. We did a number of different uh, tests in California. Finally, we uh, worked out a protocol to test two bottomless dolphins, two young male bottomless dolphins, Presley and Tab, uh, uh, who were living at the New York Aquarium where Diana was uh, working. And uh, we were able to show that both of those dolphins uh, recognized themselves in mirrors because when they were marked in different parts of their body, they used the mirror to check the marks out. That was the first demonstration of a non-primate uh, recognizing themselves in a mirror. And then since then, obviously, as we said, elephants and, and magpies. And so, you know, uh, that finding itself was scientifically very important, if you will. Um, what I didn't realize at the time was how important it would be for how I felt about my research subjects. Um, and I started to think about, okay, they're self-aware, you know, very much like us, and they're living in a tiny concrete tank, swimming around and around. And after a while, I, I began to realize that there, I, that did not feel good. That was not something that I thought was tolerable. The Presling Tab uh, were young. They were, a couple of years later, sent to other facilities, and I found out that they died of infections um, in, in marine parks, one in Florida and one somewhere else, I don't remember. And that really hit me hard because I began to realize, oh my gosh, everybody's celebrating Presley and Tab for the scientific finding, but the real story is not just the scientific finding, is the two dolphins who demonstrated this. Who were they and what was their life like? And their life was not very good. Their life was terrible and they died at very young ages. To me, that's the real story. And so that began to, I began to look into where captive dolphins come from. I began to look at the evidence for what the well being of these animals is in, in zoos and aquariums. And I didn't like what I, what I found. And, and so that's when I decided that, you know, hey, I'm mid career. Um, I'm well known for my scientific work. Uh, I've, I, you know, have a platform. I'm going to use it uh, to to give back something to those animals who who really gave us so much. Yeah, that's amazing, <laughs> and um, it also makes me really sad to think not only of Presley and Todd but also of Happy. Um, since she played such a critical role in our understanding of elephants, um, yet her life, you know, we're, we're hoping her ending is not that of Presley and Tops and that she's able to um, live the life that she was, that was stolen from her or as close to as possible, as uh, close to that life as possible that we can give her here in the That's United right. States. Exactly. There's time um, for her. There's still a chance. Yeah. Um, um, and in 2018, there was another study um, that was done by the co-author of your, your uh, groundbreaking pivotal study um, that confirmed your initial findings. And it was um, the subjects of the study were Bailey and Foster, who are currently at the National Aquarium in Baltimore. Um, and some people might not know that the National Aquarium has um, announced that they will be creating a permanent seaside sanctuary um, for their, their dolphins to live in. Um, I'm curious what your thoughts are on 
on that decision. And if you think this is going to be a new model and process for aquariums, as we our understanding of the cognitive ability and needs of bottle loads dolphins increases, um, do you think that, and, and public opinion is changing, do you think that we're going to see more aquariums do what the National Aquarium is doing? That's exactly what we want to see happen. We want sanctuary to become the new model for um, how these how these animals um, are related to, in a sense. I mean, if they can't be just released back into the ocean, which they can't be, then we need to do the best we can for them. And that's sanctuary. It's not a concrete tank. What the New York, uh, New York Aquarium, the National Aquarium is doing is phenomenal, courageous, visionary. I can't tell you how much I respect and our whole team respects what they're doing. Um, and we talk to them quite often. Uh, and we share ideas because this is all a new concept, uh, cetacean sanctuary. And very few people are even considering something like this. And so I'm really honored uh, to be, you know, working uh, and sharing ideas with them as we go forward. So yeah, they, they, really, they really are walking the walk. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's amazing. And it, it, it gives hope that the other aquariums and facilities that are holding marine mammals captives will, will follow their lead and start working to um, send their uh, cetaceans to seaside sanctuaries. Yeah, it's proof of concept, you know, I mean, because this is a novel idea. Um, but, you know, the fact is, is that it, sanctuaries for any kinds of animals were always a novel idea until they were ha until they happened and were shown to be successful in many cases and so you know if if people really knew what was going into um what that what the national aquarium is doing to prepare their animals to look for a, an ideal site and to all the things going forward that they will do to ensure that, that, that those dolphins are happy and healthy. And what we're doing for belugas and, and orcas in our sanctuary, we'll talk about that. Um, I think people would feel more at ease that this is not, this is something that is being driven by science. It's being driven yeah. by the well-being of, of those sanctuary residents. Definitely. Um, and, and before we go into the whale sanctuary projects, I know I think that's what so many people are excited to hear about because it's, it's such an amazing breakthrough and um, that you've already found a location is, is so yes. um, exciting. But um, if we could, since you are an expert in um, marine mammal uh, cognition and behavior, um, and we, we talked a little bit about bottlenose bottle dolphins, but maybe we can go into um, you know, orcas and belugas have been shown to have extraordinarily complex cognitive abilities. And if you could tell us just a little bit about um, what we what we what we know about orcas and belugas now um, about their cognition and behavior and why they um, cannot those those behaviors and needs um, cannot be met in in captivity or in places like aquariums. Yeah, sure. I mean, orcas and belugas are both extraordinarily intelligent and that's we know this from both looking at the neuroanatomy of individuals who have passed away and we get to a chance to image their brain take a look at their brain look at the size of different components of the brain and so on and so forth we've done a lot of analyses like that and their actual behavior not just in captivity and some of the cognitive work that's been done but what they do in the wild um, which is extraordinarily complex. They have culture. They have cultures, uh, meaning that different groups have different ways of doing things, and those cultural traditions are passed on from one generation to the next. They have different dialects, different ways of feeding, different ways of doing lots of things. They are also um, uh, animals who spend a long time learning how to be who they are, just like us. They have a really long juvenile period. And so their, their <clears throat> behavior is based upon learned culture. Their communication systems are so complex that we really don't really have 
much of an understanding of, of what's going on because we've only we, we've gotten the tip of the iceberg. These are animals who also can imitate vocally and behaviorally. Um, so, you know, everything that we think about when we think about, well, what does it mean to be intelligent and complex and socially complex? They have those characteristics. The other thing that's really interesting is that both orcas and beluga whales um, have menopause. <laughs> and that's really interesting because not many other animals um, go through a menopause. And by that, I mean older, in, older females stop uh, giving, stop reproducing personally, and they, they take on the role of the leader of their, their group. And they start, um, they, they, whatever they do is for the benefit of their children and their grandchildren and the younger generations. Um, and, and that's something that, you know, you find in elephants, you find in a lot of human communities, and you find in, in very um, complex intelligent species who have to pass on a lot of information from one generation to the next. That's so amazing. Um, and I think, again, I feel like I keep saying this, it's also sad to think about how that, those, um, well, well, yeah. Behaviors are just completely cut off when they're in aquariums, whether it's them being housed alone in a small um, concrete pool, um, the, the separating them from their, the wild captured orcas and belugas who have been separated from their pod, and also those that are um, captive bred and, and captive born that are separated from their familial units, and they're never really able to, to be in a pod or the normal social structure. Um, when you know about that, when you know about how, how complex they are, then you fully understand why living in a tank is not going to be something that is tolerable. Um, they don't have any culture in uh, an artificial setting. They don't have any place to go. They don't have anything to do. They don't have anything to pass on through learning. Um, and they are literally just artificial collections of individuals who are thrown together, take, ripped apart, thrown together, ripped apart. And that, that is, I mean, so, so really at face value, all you really have to do is look at how do they live in the wild? And how do they live in a concrete tank in a marine park? And the difference is striking. But if that doesn't convince you, then we have a mountain of empirical evidence to show that their well-being is incredibly poor in concrete tanks. Yeah, I think, I mean, Blackfish and the Cove are so pivotal too and really highlighting the, the, the pro just very obvious problems with keeping marine orcas and dolphins um, and I'll throw belugas in, even though they weren't covered in, in captivity in places like marine parks. Um, and yeah, there's just, there's such an overwhelming amount of scientific evidence and empirical data demonstrating the needs of these marine mammals and, and why they, those needs cannot be met in captivity. No, they can't. Um, and we're, we're hoping eventually we can, we can start arguing um, to have their rights, their personhood, um, them de to be declared legal persons and have to, their rights recognized by the courts and legislatures um, because they, they definitely are deserving of that. Well, they have all of the same characteristics. And, you know, what's, inter what's important to recognize is it's not that the people that are working at these marine parks are bad people. It's just that they have bought into a model that doesn't work. It just doesn't work for the animals. And so, you know, we want to work with them to see if we can shift, shift our culture um, that goes, you know, to go along with the data, what we now know about these animals and, and what is a good life for them. We want to do that with them, not in spite of them. That's important. And I think the National Aquarium is a great example of how, exactly. you know, the, there is recognition amongst the community that there does need to be a change um, yeah. and they can meet the needs of the animals they're currently holding captive um, by open or you know, the creation of seaside sanctuaries that allows them to engage in their innate and natural behaviors and, and hopefully build that social structure back. Um, yeah. So that, that leads us into the Whale Sanctuary Project. Um, 
uh, I don't know if you want to talk a, a little bit about what prompted you to to, to start it um, and sort of where you're at right now, because um, I know there you announced, uh, I think a couple months ago, some exciting news that you have set um, settled on a location and found where you'll be creating the first um, seaside sanctuary in North America for orcas and belugas. Yes, well, thank you. I started the Whale Sanctuary Project, uh, I think it was probably back in 2015 now, um, with a group of colleagues, and we all met at a conference in British Columbia, and we were talking about captivity and the, and the problems for, for whales and dolphins in, in, these, in the tanks, and we said, you know, why don't we do something about it? So the we started to have meetings. By 2016, I had founded and the Whale Sanctuary Project. We incorporated and we became a nonprofit. And we brought on, obviously, a board and uh, an incredible group of advisors. And, and shortly after that, we brought on our executive director, uh, Charles Vinnick, um, who was the manager of the Keiko Project. Um, and we've got a phenomenal team. Uh, people who who do know how to do this. So the the thing about such a project is it's so complex. You have to realize what you know and what you don't know, and then find the people who know stuff that you don't know, and find the best people you can to do this. And I truly believe that that's what we've done. So we've spent the past two and a half years looking for a site uh, for the first permanent sanctuary for belugas and orcas in North America. And we were in British Columbia and in the San Juan Islands in Washington. And then we also were looking in Nova Scotia, both, both uh, coast. And uh, we spent a lot of time in incredibly beautiful areas, but it's a lot of work too. Um, we finally, finally found a beautiful, a big, beautiful bay on the eastern shore of Nova Scotia called, called Port Guilford, um, which is adjacent to a wonderful community of people. Uh, it's the town of Sherbrooke. And between the beautiful, you know, the, the physical characteristics of Port Guilford and the, the fact that the people of Sherbrooke uh, was so welcoming and so interested in working with us to make this a reality. Uh, it was clear that that is that was the place we chose we needed to choose. So in February in Halifax we had a press conference, and we announced that Port Hilford was our, our site, and now we're raring to go. <laughs> so we really, you know, um, obviously there have been some pretty awful things that have happened in the world since then, and we're all still hunkering down, um, but we hope to get back to Nova Scotia as, as soon as we can. Um, and in the meantime, we're working hard on everything we can do to prepare for that, uh, having meetings over Zoom um, and collecting data and, and doing everything we can so that we, we don't lose that much time. Yeah, that's so, so exciting. Um, I was wondering if you could explain a little bit, I just looked this up, what a seaside sanctuary looks like, um, like uh, how it's set up so that, uh, sort of what, 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 it, what it will look like, because I think it's, it's sort of hard to imagine how, how you create something like that. Well, it's hard to imagine because it's, it's you know, it's, it is a, it's a huge, a huge task. So, you know, we can, Sometimes people mistake the, this for a, a sea pen, but a sea pen is really a, just a small enclosed area. It's a tank in the ocean. What we're look, talking about is something orders of magnitude larger than this. Um, in fact, our sanctuary is going to provide 300 times the space of the largest tank for dolphins and whales in the world. And although that's nowhere near what they need, if they really should be out in the ocean, it is so much better than what they have now. I mean, it's literally orders of magnitude. So it will provide the space that they need to spend their day the way they want, to swim, to play. It'll be in the ocean. So it'll be a, a fenced off part of the bay. 
Um, it will be deep enough so that uh, a netted off part of the bay. It will be deep enough so that they can explore the bottom and the fish that come through the, the bay. It'll be large enough so that if they want to separate, they can. Um, if they want to swim in a straight line, they can. Um, what we're trying to do here is replicate as much of a natural environment as we possibly can. Um, and it, it, the fact is, is that we can do that a lot better in, a, in the ocean than we can in, in a concrete tank. Oh, definitely. Um, do you have any potential future residents identified? I don't know if you can speak about that. Um, uh, well, uh, we, <laughs> no, we actually don't. But well, I also wanted to mention that the other thing is we're going to have um, different places where um, the whales can go. We're going to have a full surface veterinary staff and facility, uh, an interpretive center. We're going to have all the good stuff um, that they have in the marine parks, but we're going to have more. And that's, that's the thing. It's, we're not giving up um, the ability to care for the animals, to feed the animals, to have, you know, I mean, we're, we're actually adding to the equation. Um, but as, as far as who's coming in, we literally don't know yet. Um, we are keeping lines of communication open with facilities who have belugas and orcas. And, you know, we continue to uh, hold, hold conversations. Everybody knows what we're doing and what we're trying to do. And we're very willing to come to the table and have a, an honest, uh, serious discussion about how we can do this together. I would imagine being located in Canada, you, um, it's uh, probably a, it's a lot, not easier, but people are a lot more receptive because Canada passed Bill S203, which banned the keeping of cetaceans in captivity. And I know I want to give people time for Q&A, but you are really involved in that, um, at least yeah. in um, using the science to support um, or to demonstrate why um, their needs cannot be met in captivity. Um, and I was just curious, like, if, if you had a warm welcome in Canada. I mean, I know you said in, in uh, Nova Scotia where your, your sanctuary will be based, but um, since the, the national opinion on the keeping of marine mammals in captivity is, has shifted um, in the nation, um, if, if you've seen a difference amongst both the aquariums and the uh, um, the facilities holding marine mammals captives and the um, the national government as well. Well, we have had a warm reception in Canada. There's no doubt about it. And um, for instance, the Vancouver Aquarium is is now uh, looking to get out of the marine mammal display industry or or a practice. Um, they do a lot of fantastic real field research. So there's really no need for them to hold on to that kind of you know, practice of displaying dolphins and whales, having them do tricks and all of that. That's something of the past and they've moved forward into the future. Um, and so, yes, we've, we've had a very warm reception. I think, you know, Bill S203 uh, was something that uh, basically um, said, look, you know, you can't breed uh, these animals anymore in concrete tanks and you can't put them on display for entertainment purposes. And uh, that represents a new way of thinking. And it was really the people in Canada who, who made that happen. I mean, I presented a lot of the science about it, but I wasn't the only scientist. There were many others like Naomi Rose and Ingrid Visser, Hal Whitehead, all of us presented the science of why we don't need to keep these animals in concrete tanks and why we shouldn't. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, I want to, uh, well, I'll ask one more question and I think we'll open it up to Q&A because um, I know we've had a lot of people submit questions. Um, but for everyone watching, um, if people want to get involved or help with the Whale Sanctuary Project, um, should they go to your website or is there, there any way they can um, support the, the work you're doing there? Well, um, yes, you can go to <laughs> www.whalesanctuary.org 
and uh, check out everything we're doing. Uh, our whole team is there uh, with their bios, updates on what we're doing. You can see the actual bay that we're going to create the sanctuary in. Um, there's science papers, there's blogs, all kinds of great stuff going on. So www.whalesanctuary.org. Great. Um, so definitely check that out. And um, when we, we'll send an email around um, and post on our blog all the information about the Camilla Center for Animal Advocacy as well as the Whale Sanctuary Thank Project. You. So you can yeah. check it out. And you just had a great short film that was uh, screened at the Santa Barbara Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And um, I know it's on your website. So there's a lot of great, great, great uh, work and, and information that's available. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Do you want to start? Um, asking or Lori the questions that people from the audience have uh, submitted. Yeah, so many good questions. So the first one is actually comes from many people who are asking this question. They're asking, what is the estimated date that the sanctuary will be completed and ready for its residents? And also, um, I know you said you didn't have specific um, animals in mind. But is there a criteria or like what makes a good candidate? Yeah, criteria. For, well, uh, I'll take the first one first. Mm -hmm. uh, we continue to say that um, we are working towards the goal of having our first resident in the sanctuary by the end of next year. That's a really aggressive goal, especially given everything that's going on in the world. And But we want to maintain that goal. Um, uh, and uh, work towards that. Um, we are entering the permitting phase soon uh, where we will be working with the Nova Scotia government and the Canadian government um, to, to uh, you know, address questions about what we're doing, have more uh, public consultations, um, collecting science about uh, the, the water quality, water temperature and all of the, the the characteristics of that bay. Um, so we're working towards permitting and, and many other things. Um, and we are also at the same time working through some different designs that we uh, might be able to, to uh, implement once, once we do get permitted. Um, as far as the criteria, you know, it's interesting because we want, we, we want to choose individuals who really need to get out of the concrete tanks, and, and all of them do, but we also want to set them up for success. So, you know, we will have to look at their age, their, their health, uh, their, and not just their physical health, their mental health, um, their behavior, their personality, their history. Um, we'll have to know if they're, if they're carrying any pathogens, um, and if so, can those be controlled? We'll have to know something about their immune system function. A complete workup and complete history. Essentially, we'll have to know everything we can possibly know about any individual whale that we are considering bringing into the sanctuary. And so that will mean sharing a lot of information with uh, whatever facility has, has those whales. And uh, so um, it's, it, that will be a very, very... Um, complex process, but it's, but it's, it's one we're eager to start as soon as we can. Great, great. Yeah. And I guess this is a sort of related question. So Joe asks, what has been the biggest hurdle um, so far in that process? Hurdle. Uh, in terms of, uh, well, I think the hurdle is, is um, getting the display industry to come on side and to uh, to want to work with us to provide a better life for the animals. They, I don't doubt that they think that they are providing a good life, but I, but I, but the science tells us otherwise, and we want to work with them, not against them. So um, that big hurdle is getting uh, the people who run these entertainment parks uh, to sit down, talk to us, and take a leap of, of faith 
and and work with us uh, to create something something new. Uh, the public doesn't want to see these animals in concrete tanks anymore. What they want to see is something new, and uh, this is a good opportunity for them to to take the lead on on that. Yeah, that's fantastic. Um, so we're getting actually a lot of questions about Lolita. Um, for those who don't know, she's in the Miami Seaquarium currently. So um, there's questions about, you know, will you hope to have her in the whale sanctuary? And what are your thoughts on um, the approach that's currently being taken with Lolita? Mm. Well, you know, as you know, Lolita or Topete has been in the Miami Aquarium for over 50 years. Um, what's unique about her situation is that we know where her family is. We know where her mom is. We know where, where her pod is. Um, they're still living in the San Juan Islands in the Pacific Northwest. So we know she's a member of the Southern resident community there. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's something that's very unusual most captive orcas are born into that or we just don't know, you know, we can't find their, their, their family. So that's a compelling piece of the puzzle, right? We know where her family is. We know where she was taken from when she was about four years old. Um, but, you know, and we have actually been very involved in, in talking to people in, in that region, uh, including First Nations, the Lummi, um, and we've said, look, if she is eligible for transfer, we will work with you to try to create a home for her um, in, in her in her homeland, as it were, a sanctuary, a, a mm -hmm. place for her. Um, so we need to know if she is a good candidate in terms of her health and all of that. And, but we would stand ready to help. Um, we would, probably not bring her to our sanctuary given that we know exactly where she is and if she was going to be released we should at least put her in a place where she has a chance to see her, her family again that's that's so exciting if that could ever happen i know, I know. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm yeah yeah just She's certainly a, a uh, little tear. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, so here's a sort of scientific question. Um, so wild orcas encountering humans react to, to us in a curious sort of friendly manner. And what is that? What might that indicate about their cognition and how might that work um, as an argument for, I guess, the NHRP? Well, you know, when you talk about intelligence and having cognitive wherewithal and uh, certain species having the ability to understand the consequences of their behavior, um, certainly orcas um, have that capacity. Um, they seem to be, when they're allowed to live their life the way they want to live their life, animals who um, really are not very are violent towards each other or humans. Um, they're very cultural. They have, they adhere to their cultural traditions, whatever they may be. Um, and so, I mean, that, that has all the hallmarks of, uh, an indiv of, of species that is capable of, 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 in a sense, social rules, social mores, social uh, traditions, understanding the consequences of their behavior. So they're a lot like us in that way. Um, in fact, but they're actually a lot more rule observing than, than we are. Um, uh, and it's only when they're actually put into these unworkable situations, like living in a concrete tank for decades, that they tend to do, they become hyper aggressive sometimes and they just mentally break down. Um, but these, these are animals who, who have a way of life and, and know it. And that is an important element of being a person. Right. That's so interesting. 
Um, so here's a question from Lahu, and he asks, um, with your sanctuary, will there be any attempt to try and get the residents into a position where they could be released back into the wild? Um, no. And the reason is because, as I mentioned, for the vast majority, with the, with the exception of maybe a handful at most of workers living in concrete tanks, there is no going home because mm -hmm. they didn't come from someplace. They don't have a social group to go home to. And the social group is everything for workers and many other cetaceans. They need to be in a social network to live. They also don't know simple things like how to feed themselves. They've been living in a concrete tank their whole life or for many decades fed frozen and thawed fish. And they don't even know that a live fish is food. And so we would never do the experiment of just seeing how they do and releasing them into the unknown, um, knowing what we know now. We think that the best that we can do for them is permanent sanctuary, the biggest, deepest, most interesting place that we can offer them. Wow, yeah. And that's similar to what we're, we're arguing for in our cases on behalf of, and campaigns on behalf of Happy, um, in our prior camp, Happy and Mini, that our two elephant yeah. clients, as well as our previous chimpanzee clients. Um, a lot of people would ask um, you know, why, why we wouldn't send Happy back to Thailand. Um, and she's been held captive for so long that um, the, the safest thing for her and the best that we can do is send her to an accredited elephant sanctuary or with Tommy, Kiko, Hercules, and Leo, and a, an accredited um, chimpanzee sanctuary that allows them to live as close to their, their natural state as possible, or their wild state, their true state as possible, um, and live as close to the life as a, of a wild chimpanzee or elephant. And I think that's, that's the same as, as what you're doing, because it's not necessarily safe to release them back into the wild when they've been held captive for so long. Some people think that, oh, they're so smart, they'll figure it out. But it's precisely because they are so smart, so cultural, so dependent upon learning, that they are missing all the things that they need to learn, they needed to learn to survive and live a good life out in the wild. So it's, it's exactly the opposite of that. Wow, that's so interesting. Um, so Sylvia asks, um, do you believe keeping citations in captivity can end in general or are keeping them in the parks too uh, economically compelling for them, for these parks? Well, we hope that at some point, uh, keeping these animals in concrete tanks on display, doing shows and so forth, will be phased out. I think it is on its way out. Um, I don't think people want to see that anymore, mm -hmm. um, by and large. So I think the answer is sanctuary, because we can then move them into a sanctuary where they're still cared for, they're still fed, they still have all those advantages of, of what, what they call, you know, what we call human care. Uh, but it's a much better life. And, and then we can and stop the breeding, no breeding, and, and just phase things out that way. And I think that's the future we, we should be working towards. And yeah. also, now, now, whether or not, I mean, economically, uh, yeah, they're, they're, they make a lot of money for these places. So, mm -hmm. um, but I, I think that there are ways for these places to uh, draw crowds and people in um, without showing them workers and, and animals doing tricks or trainers, you know, riding on top of them and, and that, that kind of circus atmosphere. And I'll just add, um, even if, say, um, the economical value is certain um, aquariums find that more compelling than, than to release them, mm -hmm. um, states like, I'm very proud of my state of California, have now banned the keeping of orcas in captivity. Um, and, and ended the breeding. So even if they were to want to continue to hold them captive, 
um, states are, are recognizing that it's, it's no longer, you know, because of the science, um, you know, it's no longer acceptable to, to force them to live in captivity. Um, and so they have to be phased out. And um, I'm hopeful that other states will start to introduce similar, similar introduce and pass similar legislation and hopefully um, we can follow up or grant that with the recognition of their um, right to liberty and to not be held captive. Right, yeah. All right, so I think we have, a, um, have time for one more question. So this is a question coming from, oh, there's no name, but <laughs> anyway, so uh, they ask, the general population receives um, education on citations in marine parks. Um, if they're taken out of these settings, what are your recommendations on replacing that um, education to the general public? Well, that's a really good question. I'm glad this person asked that because although th it has been claimed for many years that going to see dolphins and whales and shows or animals in general uh, on display is educational, there's really no evidence for that. Um, I've done a lot of the work to show that that's the case. If you really look at that claim, they're not based upon a lot of data that show that when you see a dolphin or a whale in a show, or you feed them, or you swim with them, and so forth, that you come out of there um, uh, being a whole lot more educated. I mean, you might remember a few facts here and there, but it doesn't last, and it certainly does not. Um, translate into conservation ethic, which is, I think, is what zoos and aquariums want to do, right? They figure, well, we're educating people about elephants, um, and because then they can go out into the world and protect them, but there's no evidence for that. So, so that is a claim in search of evidence. Um, what we want to do with the sanctuary is tell the story of the residents and why they are in sanctuary. And we can be authentic about it. We don't have to pretend the animals are happy and healthy, performing in a concrete tank. We can say, look, they're living here because this is what they need and this is what we're giving them. And this is what all dolphins and whales should have. And then we can use that as the opportunity to really educate about the oceans, about the animals who live in the ocean, why it's important to protect the oceans uh, for the animals who, who live in them. So it's a much more authentic platform from which to do real education. You can't do education from a situation where it is set up so artificially. It just doesn't work. And, and again, um, as it sounds really good, you know, to say, go, your kids will learn and become wonderful animal advocates, but it's a, that's a very thin mm. claim. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I guess we're about to wrap up. So Courtney, do you have any last words or Laurie, any, <laughs> any? I just want to thank Laurie so much for coming on and, and talking uh, so eloquently, much more than I could about um, the scientific support for uh, non-human animal rights um, and the evidence supporting their autonomy um, and, and why they should be declared legal persons um, and the amazing work that you're doing um, with scientists and scholars at the Camilla Center um, and also about the Whale Sanctuary Project. So I just want to thank you so much for coming on here and talking about that and also for all the work that you've done and the advancements you've helped make in the fight for non-human animal rights. Um, and if there's anything um, you want to close out with, um, we'll put links to all of um, Dr. Marino's, um, the, well, her organization's uh, social media, um, their website, um, so you can learn more about um, the work uh, that she's doing. Well, thank you so much for having me. This has been a lot of fun. Um, I thank you for the great work NHRP is doing and continues to do. Um, and if anybody has further questions or comments, you know, you can reach me at info at whalesanctuary.org. Um, I answer everything. And um, I really appreciate everyone taking the time 
to discuss all of these issues. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for tuning in. Thanks so much. Thank you. Bye.